Miners were outraged by the assassinations of Hatfield and Chambers. They understood that the assassins would not face punishment for the crimes. The miners then organized and armed themselves across the state of West Virginia. One source states that Little Cold River was the first to organize and began patrolling and guarding their area. Sheriff Don Chafin sent troops to stop the activity. However, the troops were captured, disarmed, and sent fleeing from the area. Frank Keenly and Fred Mooney were leaders of the United Mine Workers, Union District 17. They called for a rally in Charleston, West Virginia. There they met with Governor Ephraim Morgan and presented him with the Union demands. The Governor refused these demands. Within days, thousands of Union supporters came to the outskirts of Marmot, which is near the state capital of Charleston. According to one source, between 5,000 to 20,000 miners gathered in Lens Creek. Both sides were intent to march to mate one. Some were already armed. Others gathered arms and ammunition on the way with the town's help that were along the path to mate one. Led by Frank Keenly and Fred Mooney, on August 24, 1921, they marched upon Mingo County to confront the coal companies, to organize the county, free the imprisoned Union men there, as well as to end martial law. Many of the marchers were WW1 veterans. To distinguish themselves on the battlefield, the miners tied red bandanas around their necks. This was so that they could be seen by fellow miners and not be shot accidentally through the wooded area. Many historians believe that this is where the term redneck comes from to this day. Logan County became the battleground as anti-union Logan County Sheriff Don Chafin had gathered men to stop the miners from reaching Mate 1. In that number were between 2,000 and 3,000 Baldwin Feltz agents county police, state militiamen, deputies, citizen militiamen, and state police. The men had constructed machine gun nests and trenches around the base of Blair Mountain and had prepared themselves for the arrival of the marching miners. At the last minute, Kinley and Mooney tried to stop the march. They had met with War Department's General Harry Banholtz. The general had warned the men that any violence would be blamed upon the Union. A ceasefire was proposed but collapsed when two miners died in a skirmish with Sheriff Don Chafin and his men. The 5,000 to 20,000 Union miners had reached the border of Logan County and had begun trading gunfire with the company supporters. Both sides met at Blair Mountain, West Virginia. The fight began between the miners and the blockade. Sheriff Chafin had fewer men, but was better armed with rented aircraft, machine guns, and bombs. On August 28, 1921, the 5,000 to 20,000 Union miners had reached the border of Logan County and had begun trading gunfire with the company supporters. Both sides met at Blair Mountain, West Virginia. The fight began between the miners and the blockade. Sheriff Chafin had fewer men, but was better armed with rented aircraft, machine guns, and bombs. On August 30, 1921, President Warren G. Harding threatened to enact martial law in West Virginia and all counties affected by the conflict. Those counties were Boone, Mingo, Logan, and Kenawa. He gave the ultimatum that the fighting had to cease by noon on September the 1st of that year. Also standing at the ready were troops from the 26th and 19th Infantry Divisions at Camp Dix, New Jersey, 
and Camp Sherman, Ohio. The troops would be sent by train to West Virginia when needed. On August 31, 1921, the heavy fighting started when the group of 75 miners, led by Reverend Wilburn, came across a group of Logan's defenders on the ridge. Each side asked the other for a password. When the wrong one was given, the fighting started. Three deputies and one miner were killed in the skirmish. Later that day, the main group of miners gave a two-pronged attack against the trenches and breastworks of the Logan's defenders. Using machine gun fire from the higher ground, the defenders were able to push back the Redneck Army despite their overwhelming numbers. On September 1, 1921, the Redneck Army looted a company store and got a Gatling gun and assaulted a spot called Craddock Fork. Fighting went on for three hours as the defenders were using their machine gun. When the machine gun jammed, the miners made a huge surge forward and broke the defensive line, only to be pushed back by a second machine gun. Chafin had chartered three private biplanes and had them equipped with homemade bombs, pipe bombs loaded with nuts and bolts, and tear gas. This effort failed to inflict any casualties, even though they were dropped over two of the Redneck Army's strongholds. A squadron of U.S. Army reconnaissance planes began patrolling the skies on this day and the next day. The troops from the U.S. Army and Army National Guard, led by William Eubanks, a McDowell County native, arrived and started unloading equipment. On September 2, 1921, ignoring the threat, the Union leaders continued to encourage the miners to continue fighting. 2,500 federal troops arrived with machine guns and armed military aircraft. They also brought gas bombs and explosives that were used in World War I. Seeing that they were now fighting a losing battle, the miners and the unions backed off and disarmed themselves. Fighting, however, continued in some areas until September 4th. Around 1,000 miners surrendered to the army while the rest went home. While the numbers of dead have never been confirmed, there are estimates of 20 to 100 killed on the minor side and 30 killed on the Chafin side of the conflict. There were hundreds of wounded and injured. It is estimated that one million rounds of ammunition were fired during the days of the battle. Many faced charges of murder, conspiracy to commit murder, accessory to murder, insurrection, and treason against the state of West Virginia for their participation in the march from Lynn's Creek to Logan County and the ensuing battle of Blair Mountain. These charges were levied against 550 to close to 1,000 miners and labor activists including Kingley and Mooney. After all of the legal battles, most of the men were acquitted while others spent years in prison. However, the legal battles had taken a huge toll on the bank accounts of the UMWA. The union's membership also dropped by half in the years between 1921 and 1924. This membership further dropped to just a couple of hundred miners by the 1930s. However, this battle did lead to some improvements in working conditions at the mines. The battles raised awareness of the harsh working conditions of the coal mines. Unions also had a change in tactics in political battles. This major change helped the unions get laws passed to help the labor. We thank you for watching our series on Mate One and the Battle for Blair Mountain.